So, so I want to thank everyone for their participant. Well, first, let me just double check with Sophie and Julie. You can all see the screen, the slides. Yes, it's perfect. Great. And you can hear me. All right. All right. So thank you all for your participation today. Uh, we look forward to updating all of you on the progress that's been made and to discuss our future plans. We also will need your participation and input during today's session during a small work group that we're going to be forming and more information will be shared about that. Afterwards, I'll be delighted to hear from you directly any questions or comments you may have about what we shared with you today. The presentation of this portion of this meeting will be recorded and shared on our website for those who are unable to participate. Now, before I continue, I would like to begin with a land acknowledgement. So colleagues, acknowledging the lands that we have we are on has been a practice we've introduced at each of our public meetings. In light of the recent racist tragedies we have experienced as a country, the attack in London and the discovery of 215 souls in Kamloops, this time I want to ask, please join me in respectfully acknowledging the First Nations, Inuit and Métis lands we are on by also sharing with us in the chat the lands that you are on. As we meet virtually this afternoon across the country, I would like to acknowledge that we are all located on different unceded traditional territories belonging to many different nations. It is important we, that we work hard to understand the long history of these lands and that I recognize what those histories mean for the work ahead for Andrio. Land acknowledgements hopefully encourage us to think about the history that brought each of us here and where we are and where we try to understand our place within that history. I myself am based in Toronto and I acknowledge that I am on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. Others, my colleagues at our head office in Ottawa, are located on unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishabeg nation, where those of you perhaps in Montreal are situated on the traditional ter territory of the Kenyakahaka. As we move on to the proceedings of our meeting, it is with this acknowledgement of the First Nations, Inuit and Métis nations and communities who have been harmed by colonial and unethical research and the data sovereignty and research priorities of these nations and communities. We commit to understanding and taking up NGOs role in reducing harm and advancing reconciliation in research. So colleagues, this is the agenda for the formal presentation portion. Much of what we've tried to do today is try to address some of the issues, concerns and questions that many of you have. And so we'll begin with a quick overview of the introduction and purpose, some of our key accomplishments to date, where we wish to go in terms of our ecosystem, what we're using a sports analogy uh, in terms of our playbook and what we hope to accomplish over the next few months. And then very clearly, we want to communicate what we know today and what we wish to know going forward, some considerations for discussion over the next few months, and also to share with you how we hope you will remain connected and any next steps and take key takeaways that we have. Now, the purpose of today's presentation is twofold, to inform and to transmit information about the transition plans that are underway, but also to discuss with you how you will be engaged and to seek your view on how you wish to be engaged. Now, before proceeding with this presentation, folks, I wanted to begin today's session with an apology. A meeting like this is long overdue. To be clear, we continue to meet with many of you through our working groups and the various committees and consultations that we've been undertaking, but I sincerely feel too much time has passed for such a gathering. Moreover, it's not that we didn't think to do so or it didn't occur to us, but there were often intervening fair factors that inhibited us. At the end, it's my accountability as the CEO. And so it's been too long and I take accountability and responsibility for that. And for that, I apologize. I also want to read, with you, read for you a quote from the blog that was just released this morning. This is a blog that I put out routinely in my way of trying to connect with the community and share some of our thinking as it's evolving over the course of the months. This particular blog is dedicated to all of you. Canada's treasured, highly qualified personnel. And in the quote I say, or in the blog I say, Canada's HQP are often the unsung heroes of the DRI ecosystem, like powerful supporting actors whose performance is inspiring and instrumental to a scene 
Sometimes their contributions to the entire movie or show are so vital that they warrant recognition through a Best Supporting Actor win through the Oscars. Canada's HQP are the backbone of a growing and thriving Canadian DRI ecosystem through their specialized support of researchers at universities, libraries, and other institutions across Canada. Ask any researcher using DRI and they will unquestionably tell you it was the HQP who managed data, enabled storage, refined algorithms, or optimized the codes that made their research possible. It actually hurts me, folks. The, the, so end of quote. <laughs> But it actually folks, hurts me, folks, to hear some of the rumors that have been gathering, and and we and that you know the, the one I heard that hurt me most was that H, that Endrio intends to cast aside HQB. Nothing could be further from the truth, or that in fact we we wish to shrink the number of HQP. Nothing could be further from the truth. In that context, I also wish to be as clear as we can. And later in this presentation, I'm hoping to leave you with 10 take key takeaways about the value each of you bring to Canada's DRI ecosystem. In terms of some of our key accomplishments to date, I want to share with you uh, the work that we've been doing over the last few months. Over 141 institutions have enrolled as members of our corporation structure, with 70 universities, 23 colleges, 16 research hospitals, and 32 DRI research institutes. The 22 member researcher council, which is geographically represented uh, from across the country and representing a variety of different subject matter experts, continue to be at the forefront in, in terms of providing us with guidance and advice about the directions our ecosystem ought to take, but more importantly, from their own perspectives as researchers, how to best meet the needs of the people we all serve. The research needs assessment that we had undertaken was completed with 105 position papers and over 300 authors. All of the results for that uh, needs assessment have been shared with ARC regional CEOs, as well as with many of you through the eight town halls that were conducted a month ago. All of you participated in large numbers. We had over 1,080 participants in the eight town halls, both in English, foreign English, foreign French, providing us with validation and synthesis of some of the findings that we were sharing based on a series of different themes. The needs assessment itself, this is something that is truly humbling. 1,380 researchers from across the country in HQP completed a survey that, based on if-then statements, could take up to 20 minutes. And you did so over the month of December, one of the busiest months as you, future, as you state, serve the futured minds of our post-secondary generation. And yet you completed it in large numbers. When we started to break down the demographics and the different disciplines, we found it matched to the decimal point the distribution of researchers from across the country. So we're very, very excited to be able to delve more deeply with the guidance of our researcher council and the various uh, working committees and our CEOs from the regions to begin to look and see how we can learn to fully meet the needs of the researchers. We had our first inaugural funding opportunity, which will be sh uh, launched shortly. We've run into a few delays, quite honestly, with respect to the approvals, but uh, within a month or so, we're hoping to be able to get more clarity and more information out to all of you. As an organization, we hired our entire senior team and many of the directors who now will roll up their sleeves and begin participating in the national service delivery model work that we'll be sharing with you uh, and talking a little bit about in terms of the process as we unfold. But at the end of the day, our thanks go to all of you because throughout all of this different work and all of these different situations, you continue to serve Canada's researchers and there was no interruption that we heard about and you continue to feed and, and support the minds of Canada's future HQP through your own training and development activities. So one of the things I wanted to share with you is how you can contribute uh, in terms of the uh, uh, input to the to the DRI process and to the transition process. So as we've shared, we are underway in terms of developing a national service delivery model, which will provide us with an outline of how we wish to serve. We are currently in the throes of our strategic plan where we're developing uh, our, our mission, vision and values with our board, our stakeholder committee, our researcher council, the ARC regional CEOs and many other individuals who are participating in that process. 
and we'll soon be embarking upon a set of DRI transition groups, looking at things like services and operations, effective communication, as well as the financing, the funding model that many of us have been talking actively about and, and wanting to be able to move forward with. We also have had engagement in monthly town halls and sorry we will have opportunities for you to engage through monthly town halls and we also strongly encourage you to speak with your institutional and your regional leaders as you seek information and in going forward every two weeks i meet for 90 minutes with the ceos of the arc regions and almost every six weeks i meet with the regional or the leaders of the host sites and the national data centers the system leaders that we have uh, in place and so through that we're hoping to be able to share and convey information as well as obviously receive information so uh, using the, the sports analogy of a playbook, this is the work that has to happen over the course of the next few months. And so the purpose of this particular slide is not only to share the number of different individuals and intervening uh, groups that we have to meet with, because it's not really all up to Endrio to decide, nor should it ever have been, but it is truly a federation where there are a variety of different people that we hope to engage with, to learn from, to hear from, and be able to respond as we develop the national services delivery model and work towards identifying what are national services. There are, as you can see in the month of June, a series of workshops, uh, a series of meetings. This Friday, we meet with the pan-Canadian government leaders who have provided funding support uh, to, to enable uh, our, our DRI ecosystem. And we're gonna be talking to them about the model and some of their uh, needs and considerations. I share that particular one because it's most important for you to know that by September, many of the timelines in this or many of the milestones within this overall timeline are being driven because we need to give information to provincial funders in order for them to put into their business planning activities uh, what kinds of uh, funding dollars we're putting on the table and, and, and what the cost share and opportunities will be. Um, as you can see throughout these slides, there's many opportunities for us to engage with our researcher council and the variety of different other groups. But some of the highlights uh, in terms of when you will have information, because that's been a question that's routinely been asked, when will we actually hear about some of these things? We're hoping to be able to announce uh, funding commitments for national host sites, funding commitments for the Federation HQP throughout the country uh, in the month of July. This is actually needed so that we can begin the conversations and start to formulate the national service delivery model, formulate our mission vision uh, values, but ultimately create that draft funding model for Canada's DRI ecosystem, uh, as well as engaging all of the different folks. By September the 28th, which is our annual general meeting, we're hoping to have a new name. Uh, Julie has just completed the RFP for a branding firm and we've selected a firm. So those of you said, are we gonna be Andrea? Well, you'll, uh, you'll be uh, assured to know no. We had no plans of ever keeping Andrea as our final name, but we are embarking upon a, a process to help us identify a new name as well as logo and, and tagline. Uh, this Canada Day, I'm traveling to Ottawa with our Chief Financial Officer, Narinder, where we're going to be looking at a few properties to settle our, our uh, head office. Uh, and so more details about that as we move forward. But the other key message to take from all of this is the, uh, while it may look really busy, and it is quite frankly very busy, um, we have every confidence that we're going to hit our timelines because in order for us to move forward and sign our own uh, contribution agreement with uh, Innovation Science Economic Development Industry Canada, we have to have all our materials in place to be able to put forward the proposal to ISED so we can actually see our funding by April 1st, 2022. So uh, uh, overall, uh, a lot of engagement, a lot of activity, but um, every confidence that we're going to hit those milestones and timelines. So I, I wanted to be clear and particularly clear on this next two slides in terms of some of the questions that have been that have been emerging, as well as some of the concerns that you've all expressed uh, in terms of the directions that we're undertaking. Sorry, I'll go back. Um, I wanted to share with you that it is absolutely our commitment to continue to fund highly qualified personnel across Canada because we believe you are the backbone in supporting their researchers and their support teams. Um, I, I mentioned at, my, at the outset some of the concerns where people said, oh, we're, are you hoping to shrink the number of HKB? Again, nothing can be further from the truth. We have plans to grow the number of HQP in Canada, not reduce. 
And, and again, a point of clarification here, when I refer to HQP, not only am I referring to many of the people on this call, if not all of the people on this call who have been working within the Federation, but I speak about the archivists, the data preservation folks, uh, the data curation folks, I'm talking about cybersecurity professionals, all of the different individuals who make possible the tools and the services that researchers need in order to continue to provide innovation in Canada. I want to reinforce for you that training and development of researchers and their support teams is a priority. This training will continue using existing programs. I'm very familiar based on prior roles, all of the remarkable work uh, that all of you have put forward from YouTube videos to summer schools and many of those kinds of things. Not only will those continue uh, through funding that we're hoping to make available, but we're hoping to see new ones as training needs start to emerge and, and, and new techniques are needed. Think about the fact over about five years ago, uh, it was the Federation that was providing things like training in R or Python. And many of the post-secondary institutions have subsequently responded. And now, depending on the program you're in, um, R and Python are routinely offered as software uh, programs. And so the emergence I refer to is the fact that once it's being proliferated and, and offered in a number of sectors, um, R, HQP, look at the growing needs and the upcoming needs, the cutting edge needs of our, of our uh, researchers and their teams, and then begin to step in and fill that gap. The fourth area that in terms of what we know and what I want to reinforce for all of you on this call, we have no plans to hire all 200 HQP into our organization. Um, many of you have shared with me, these are, is Andrio going to be hiring all of us? Like, why would you do that? And, and the honest answer is we have no plans to do that. Um, as I've spoken with many of you, you've all said, you know, I'm a researcher. I started as a researcher and I started, I started to learn about the services that are required. And that's what gravitated me towards, uh, you know, Cynet or towards ACENET or Calco Quebec and supporting CEDAR or many of these things. There's a prestige. There's a, there's a value I place on being associated with SFU or McGill or, or any of our post-secondary other institutions in the country. And, so, and, and more importantly, as we've been doing our own investigations in terms of a national service delivery model, there's been nothing that's communicated to us that that would improve services. So I want to leave that with you, that there is no plans to do that. Instead, we are exploring every available vehicle to us through secondments, service level agreements, transfers of funding to allow you to remain amongst your colleagues, do that, uh, continue that sort of shared learning uh, in addressing the needs of researchers and continue to facilitate that, uh, that, that service that you're all uh, so proudly and well known for. A fifth item, many of you have presented to us at our brown bag series that Compute Canada head office and the regions have uh, very kindly arranged. And so I want to thank you. It's been enormously helpful. Um, but one of the questions that started to emerge is, do you plan as a result of this to dismantle the committee structure? Again, that's not the case. We do plan to continue a committee structure in uh, as we uh, shape our new models. Now, having said that, we do see there are opportunities and, and even the individuals who've presented to us have shared opportunities to more closely align themselves with other uh, national committees. So we see that happening, but it's not gonna be like on September 1, boom, all of this change is gonna happen. It's gonna evolve over the course of a few years. Without question, folks, change is coming good change is coming. But in order to manage change more effectively, it's going to take time in order for us to be able to do many of these things. But more importantly, every one of the decisions that we make, and I'll repeat this a couple of times, every one of the decisions we make is, is examined through the lens of are we disrupting research in Canada or are we supporting researchers in their continuing need to access DRI services? And so any major change that was going to result in substantial disruption um, is something that we're you know, moving away from while still trying to evolve and improve things as we, as we uh, collectively have conversations with all of you. The second point, the second portion of this is Another thing to think about is uh, a cost sharing model will continue in terms of federal, provincial and institutional contributions for DRI. Why that's important is it continues to allow for a shared voice. 
while we've been given the opportunity from two years ago before even Endrio was formed through the national DRI strategy that I said had put forward that resulted in, in uh, Endrio being formed, some of the percentages were shared there where things like 100% up to 100% of funding is available for uh, national host sites, up to this much percentage is available for um, uh, regional and, 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 uh, and federation-based activities. So the conversations from a couple of slides that I've shared with you is starting to look at what if we used this percentage, what would be the implication? Can we continue to afford it without compromising services? So that's the nature of, of conversations, but it is going to be a shared funding model moving forward. The iterative consultation that's taking place around the design, the development of Endrio service delivery model um, uh, is involving a number of partners. There have been have over 700 organizations and individuals that we've met with over the last few months, and that continues to take place. I think many of you would support that. While it's, you know, consultation is difficult and consultation takes time, it makes sure that we have uh, heard and we are informed and in making educated decisions about the directions that we're undertaking. The other point I wanted to make uh, in terms of the top 10 sort of takeaways or, or what we know right now is that implementation of a national service delivery model, and so I've been quite purposeful in my choice of words, implementation of a national service delivery model will occur over the next few years. We're not starting from a blank slate. We're looking at our system and we're saying, what are the strengths that we wish to continue? And what are some of the opportunities that we have in terms of improving services? Services that all of you have said to us, you know, here's something that's working real well, but it's it, it really does need to be in, uh, improved. In the context of an example of, say, for the uh, advanced research computing community, um, you know, even, even Eduardo and my colleagues uh, who've been managing CCDB have said, it works beautifully. We get a number of different performance metrics and, and other examples from that, but it's been years since we've improved and and uh, and updated to you know our, our uh, CCDB database. So, is that an area we can do? And and that would be a perfect example. We can't take it down and say, okay, let's fix it and then put it back up. All of you are so dependent. We're so dependent on it. And so that would be an example where through a national service delivery model, we'd look at the key role that CCDB would play in supporting the federation and how we would begin to uh, improve upon it and what role it would it would uh, continue to proliferate around service pro, uh, service provision I want to also share with you, we've heard loudly and clearly that there needs to be a greater openness to involving industry in the design and development of new tools and opportunities. In particular, I want to sort of ground this in, uh, as we've been looking and working with our cybersecurity professionals at Canary, in the host sites, and in other different forums, many have said industry is ahead of the game in terms of this. The, the proliferation, the frequency of hacks and, and state-sponsored actions have really, you know, um, gone full front or, or full throttle in terms of uh, what we've experienced around COVID. And so we need to partner with industry to find out what are the best mechanisms because simply doing MFA isn't going to protect us from the kind of onslaught that we've all been experiencing protecting national research and education in Canada. And then I want to end with some of the with the point I made on the prior slide. Every decision will be made with a lens towards positively impacting researchers and their innovative work in Canada. Um, uh, some of the other decisions uh, or consultations that uh, uh, will happen with regards to the playbook that we, uh, that we shared with you is that um, we want to talk to folks about with Endrio being responsible for service coordination at the national level and defining over time a common basket of services. How would that actually work? What would that look like? What, what should be included in that common basket of services? Many of our, um, uh, our uh, researchers have said, I love the DRI ecosystem, but for, in terms of my postdocs and some of my students, it's only that, you know, they only get access if they know someone else who's plugged into SharkNet or plugged in at SFU or plugged in at, uh, at uh, CalCool Quebec. So is there something you could do to advertise the basket of services that, you know, would, would uh, be available to researchers as they, as they conduct their work? Um, a national service delivery model will continue to exist. It's not as if by September, October, we unveil something and we say, okay, there you go. That's our model for the next five years. It's in fact going to be a lot of trial and error and a lot of iteration as it continues to reflect the changing needs of researchers. 
think about just even the evo evolution of technologies from quantum to machine learning to um, uh, uh, AI and other things, you know, how would we continue to think about providing those services through the Federation? Um, most recently, my teammates in Portage, in the Portage Network have been supporting the um, uh, requirement that the Tri-Councils have put out around having data management frameworks. So a service model would incorporate all of those things. What are the cybersecurity protections that we would put in place? What are the research software pieces that we would need to put in place to continue to meet those needs? And so really what the national service delivery model that we've been developing and, and, and consulting over will, will identify or stipulate the structures that support service delivery, as well as the training and development strategy for HQP. Right now, we're in active conversation with the regional CEOs. In particular, I want to give a shout out to Greg Glukman at ACENET for the remarkable uh, work that they're doing in terms of looking at a learning management strategy and what electronic tools do we want to put in place in terms of a learning management system that continues to not only report on the progress we're making around uh, develop, training and development, but also looking at some of the gaps and areas that we may wish to fill going forward. So, Numerous conversations are taking place and really exciting things are, are starting to emerge through those conversations. Other considerations that we're, we're engaged in is uh, actively working around definitions for national, regional and local services. Um, through the transition working groups uh, that I shared with you earlier. So we're about to form and engage all of you. So this is not being done to you. This is being done with you, where we're engaging you, the people at the front line who are delivering the services to say, it makes more sense for this to be a national service for the following reasons. And this should be defined more regionally because of the uniqueness of this particular need that researchers are expressing. Um, I've already made mention about, you know, as we start to think about national, regional, and local definitions, and 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 put some um, uh, put put pen to paper and start to sort of uh, see clarity around that. Uh, we're hearing more about, you know, if we fund national systems uh, up to 100% through perhaps the, uh, service level agreements, so we can keep the Cedar folks close to one another, the Cynet folks, the Sharknet folks, the folks in Calcul Quebec, the folks in AceNet. Um, how would that actually function? What would be the nature of those service agreements? Federation staff will continue to be funded using flexible mechanisms identified, uh, which I referenced earlier. So this allows you to stay close to home, working with the organizations that you have history and employment relationships with. And we're exploring with the host site leaders and, and many others, uh, many other stakeholders, uh, you know, what would service, agreement look, service agreements look like or, or secondments to continue to ensure that service delivery. Specifically, I just wanted to leave with you, HQP Federation staff will remain employees of their institutions providing support to researchers who are accessing those services. These are the conversations underway and we're working towards achieving these particular goals. So we're in the home stretch folks. Uh, in terms of next steps, uh, some of the things that we're embarking upon are finalizing our national service delivery model, finalizing our strategic planning, uh, naming and branding, which uh, Julie will, will you know, engage you in uh, in the coming weeks and months. We also want to, uh, and there's going to be a poll opportunity that Sophie will, will um, uh, enable uh, in terms of uh, meeting with you. So I started with an apology, but I also want to rectify uh, that situation in creating clear, predictable dates uh, where we can begin to meet with you. And so we're going to be setting up monthly opportunities to provide you with updates, share with you some of the thinking, uh, and engage you as we're going to uh, shortly uh, through some of our consultants and, and others. Uh, so these are the dates that we'll be putting out in broad calendar invites around monthly meetings over the next three to four months. Um, there are also ongoing uh, written communication opportunities uh, that will become available, and there's a, a last slide, as well as active and continuous transition planning and change management initiatives that we're going to be uh, sharing with you. So how to stay connected, uh, and this is my last slide, I believe, folks. Um, you know, we're hoping you will actively attend monthly town halls with Andrio, communicate with your organizational and regional leaders, express some of the areas that are working well, some of the areas where you wish you were more engaged. And so I'm specifically talking about uh, those you have employment relationships with, your host site leaders, folks that you have, um, you know, folks like uh, uh, Ranel, Suzanne, Greg, and, and John, and others, uh, participate in the transition working groups that will shortly be announced. Uh, you can sign up uh, for our Cyber Impact Newsletter, which you know provides you with updates um, 
you know, uh, read the read the blog that uh, that tends to talk about some of the thinking that's that's underway, as well as some of our other social media opportunities. And I think that brings me yes. So how we're uh, how we're hoping to address your questions after today's meeting, uh, future town halls through your home institutions, through the regional consortiums like SharkNet and, and CAC and, and many others, uh, through your direct supervisors and your various regional organizations. Uh, and that brings me to the conclusion of my formal presentation. Um, with that said, I realize I actually jumped over poor Glenn, who was going to uh, provide us with a land acknowledgement en français. And so if you would indulge us, I would still like to do that uh, and turn back to Guylaine. Bonjour à tous. Uh, je m'appelle Guylaine Roquet. Je suis la vice-présidente de stratégie de la planification pour la NOIRN. J'ai hâte que le nom change. Uh, et je vous remercie pour votre temps et votre participation aujourd'hui. Ça nous a fait plaisir de vous informer là, des progrès accomplis et des discussions euh, qui concernent nos projets futurs. Et puis, on a hâte de jouer notre rôle euh, au niveau de la coordination des activités euh, pour le support de l'infrastructure numérique de recherche euh, au Canada. Euh, nous avons également besoin de votre participation, de votre contribution au cours d'un petit atelier là, qui va suivre. Ensuite, nous serons ravis de vous écouter, de répondre à vos questions et je vous invite à les poser en français. Euh, et ça nous fera plaisir d'y répondre en français si vous vous sentez plus confortable dans cette langue. Donc, la présentation aussi est enregistrée et euh, elle va être disponible sur notre site web dans quelques jours. Euh, et je vous invite là, à inviter vos collègues là, qui n'ont pas pu être présents aujourd'hui à aller la visionner euh, pour qu'ils puissent partager la même information qui vous a été donnée aujourd'hui. Donc, au niveau de la reconnaissance du territoire, euh, Euh, donc, je vais, je vais la faire en français. J'ai beaucoup apprécié là, la participation de toutes les personnes qui nous ont euh, indiqué les, euh, les différentes nations là, qui, euh, qui euh, sont sur le territoire qu'ils occupent. Et euh, je vais faire de même. Euh, alors que nous nous rencontrons virtuellement dans plusieurs points du pays, je voudrais reconnaître que nous sommes tous situés sur des territoires traditionnels non cédés de différentes nations. Il est important de comprendre la longue histoire qui a amené chacun d'entre nous à résider sur ces terres et de chercher à comprendre notre place dans cette histoire. Je suis moi-même basé à Montréal et je reconnais que je suis situé sur le territoire traditionnel des Kenyan Kaaka. D'autres Ottawa se trouvent sur le territoire non cédé de la nation Algonquin Anishinaabe. Quant à ceux de Toronto, ils se trouvent sur le territoire traditionnel de nombreuses nations, dont les Mississauga du Crédit, les Anishinaabe, les Chippewa les Odenoshoni et les Wendat. Je voudrais exprimer notre respect à tous les peuples des Premières Nations, des Inuits et des Métis qui ont, très, qui ont les, été lésés par la recherche coloniale et non éthique, ainsi que la souveraineté des données et des priorités de recherche de ces nations et communautés. Nous nous engageons à comprendre et à assumer le rôle de la NIRN pour réduire les préjudices et faire progresser la réconciliation dans la recherche. » 